There's an interesting fact about pensions in Jamaica. Only 20% of the workforce has a pension. What will happen when all of those persons retire? It's really less than 20% never. So it's more looking like 10% of the working population that really has a pension. And it's really a significant problem. So just imagine when, as I said earlier, when all those persons reach retirement and they do not have an income to really um, to live on at that particular age. They are, they are going to be dependent on the state, dependent on their relatives, you know, dependent on, on family members overseas, and it's really not a good position. Added to that, we also have an aging population. So it's really a very dim situation, but I think a number of, 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 of things are being done right now, and I guess we'll speak about that later, which I'm very hopeful um, that I think our situation will, will improve. You at, at Sajikor, you have the largest pension funds in Jamaica. Um, I'm sure um, Conroy will have a lot to say about that, but where are we pensions in Jamaica? Okay, so you're correct. So we are the largest fund manager and administrator in Jamaica. We manage about 60% of the plans that are in the private sector. What has really been happening is a trending downwards of the coverage to where we are today. And you know, when we look at that coupled with the pressure that employers are coming under now in respect of the COVID-19 and the impact on their businesses, which fund the pension plan partly, its members and companies that fund jointly, we are, we are looking at significantly hard times in terms of them trying to hold on to their pension plans and maintain those pension coverages. So it it's really is looking as if we are going to be in a real battle to try and keep the numbers that we have and perhaps even build it. it. It's looking, it depends a lot of course on how we rebound from this crisis that we're in. Uh, clearly, if the economy rebounds and we're, you know, people are optimistic about what's going to happen, we should see that number improving, albeit slowly. But really we're in a fight now to keep the coverage in place. And it's really, a, it's really, a lot will happen based on what unfolds and how we, we react to those um, changes coming up. This challenge that we have facing Jamaica now in the area of social security protection is the low rate of coverage and participation. And I think we need to look at that also within the context of our particular demographics. When you couple that with a large proportion of workers operating in the informal sector and with low incomes, it makes saving for retirement and participation particularly challenging. And then also we have an environment where um, private sector employers are not required to set up pension plans. Um, and so as long as it becomes something that remains something that's optional, um, you will find that <clears throat> as the economic realities become a lot more potent, especially coming out of COVID, you're going to see a lot of pensions plans coming under pressure. Um, and the truth is, as Conor said, people now are living longer and longer, and the number of young persons entering the workforce, then that's actually slowing down. And so you're finding that um, the old age dependency ratio, as Conor alluded to, is actually going to worsen. I mean, the International Labour Organization anticipated that by 2030, our old age dependency ratio would be at 14.9, which is a move from 7.9 when we were um, just um, became independent. So you're seeing, seeing a lot of pressure where that is. So people in the workforce are going to know beyond a lot of pressure to support our pensioners um, in retirement. And I think that because the demographic reality is so, um, is so fundamental to the problem, I think a solution that targets the demographic, the specific demographic is important. So one of the things that the, the government is looking at, the FSC, is the implementation of a micropensions framework which would see um, you know, a sustainable mi micropensions program which targets persons with low income, um, targets persons who are informally employed. And if it's successful, we might be able to see a rapid rollout uh, um, at scale of a pension arrangement that will see more persons participating, albeit in a small amounts, in a micro way, but if done properly and if done in a sustained way, we could actually see persons having something um, to, um, a retirement benefit when they reach that age.
Uh, but Constance, let me ask this. Is it enough what we have now in terms of arrangements? NIS plus private pensions. So between 2004 and now, we've lost about 400 pension plans. 400 pension plan, plans? How many are left now? We now, have, we now have 379, coming down from just over 800. So we're now at around 10% of the labor force covered in private sector plans. In addition to that, of course, there are the civil servants who are in the government. That is up okay. somewhere, be somewhere between 50, around 50,000, 50, I, would, I would imagine. So how are we ever going to address this? The solution that's been um, on for the last several years, and is now we're now adding the micro pensions onto that but those two solutions the first one was approved retirement schemes approved, uh -huh. approved retirement schemes were introduced under the pensions act and these were to allow persons who are not members of employer sponsored plans to be able to contribute the 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 pension role is now about 50 percent of the coverage are through the approved retirement schemes okay. and the problem with that employers are by large not contributing to the approved retirement schemes employees contributions are sporadic so they make a payment here and there isn't a payment again for a while so if we if we if we drill down to the persons who are actually contributing month by month into, an, into a pension arrangement, it's significantly less than the 10% that we think we have. So now, we, so now we're looking at um, adding to that micro pensions and the micro pensions, uh, you know, it's a wonderful idea, except that this is going to be another situation where a person is going to voluntarily put some money into a pension arrangement. Just based on how the approved retirement schemes are doing, we can imagine that the contributions are going to be sporadic and they're not just going to be sporadic, they're also going to be very small. Very small contributions, very small accounts, very small accounts mean very small pensions. So once again, we're going to count numbers and we're going to tell ourselves that our coverage has improved, but we're still going to get to 95% of the population getting to retirement age and not having meaningful pensions. So 95%, those are frightening numbers. Here's the good news. Here, here's the good news. The, the one, in my mind, really good thing that happened in the last few years, the tourism works pension scheme. If we, if we can make it work, by my understanding, this is targeting 350,000 tourism workers. Employers, for those who are employed, will be contributing. If we could make this work, then this could be an example for other industries, agriculture, construction. If in the next five years, 350,000 tourism workers began to contribute to pension plans in a meaningful way, 5% by the employee, 5% by their employers, when there is no employer, the employee needs to find a way to put in the whole 10% themselves, then that would take the coverage up from the 10% that we're now looking at to more like 37%. The way to provide meaningful pensions to poor people, which, which is largely what we have in Jamaica, and the reason why in so many other countries we can talk about pensions in a different way, has to be through 
a sensible social security system, which is our NIS. NIS works because everybody, the high paid earner, the low paid earner, we all put our money into the same fund and essentially the higher paid earners are subsidizing the lower paid ones. So me and my big salary and the domestic worker and her 7,000 per week at the end of the day, so long as we all contribute for the same 35 years, we get out essentially the same pension. Right. And it allows, the, it allows the poor person to retire with something that's meaningful. If we are ever going to hope to solve the pension crisis in Jamaica, we have got to make the national insurance scheme work. So, so if I, if I may, you know, I, while I'm eagerly anticipating the findings of the consultant that the FSC has recently engaged to look at micro pensions, I am of the view that adopting a national, a kind of nationwide model where it maps out the national insurance scheme is the best way to do it. Because the NI contemplates persons who are in the, who are formally employed. So there has to be some kind of, um, you know, adapting that, that the, the NIS scheme to accommodate persons who are informally employed or low income workers, oftentimes with no employer to match contributions. And so I think because the NIS scheme exists and there are a lot of um, efforts being made now, I mean, I sit on the NIS um, National Insurance Fund Reform Commission, where we're looking at ways in which the entire model can be, can be restructured. And we've recently submitted our recommendations to the minister. I think that if, if the recommendations are in fact adopted, and we can look at how we can tailor make a micro pensions aspect to fit into the NIS, because it is a system that's already in place and it will be a part of our social security system. And I think that's why the tourism workers pension arrangement, which I you know, applaud, has to stand a little, a little apart because it's, it's industry driven and it's industry driven where by and large there are employers that can support it. Um, so micro pensions as a as a as a model needs to be focused on, as I said, the low income workers, persons who are informally employed. So we're talking about your taxi drivers, your market vendors, your fish vendors, um, persons who need to get, need to have a different approach to getting them to participate. And there are a lot of jurisdictions where there has been success, but it has to be driven by at a government level. And the use of technology is, is critical and instrumental. Thing. Um, participation and, and tapping into behavioral economics to kind of understand how you can nudge um, persons to participate. But right. I agree with Constance that we need to be careful that we don't over, um, overburden the environment with too many different types of structures. And at the end of the day, we don't get to meaningful coverage because we do spend a lot of time talking about 10% and 15% if you consider public sector workers we're not really looking at what does the actual pension look like in retirement because that's really the most important thing so we pat ourselves on the back if we move from 10 to 30 to 50 to 60 but if at the end of the day the percentage doesn't actually equate to a meaningful replacement in ratio then it, it might as well um we've not put in the effort at all you know how meaningful uh Kenneth, is is this matter of pensions right now in terms of the, 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 the assets that you have to manage very quickly. Uh, so I should say that, I mean, uh, pensions are generally long-term investments. And so, you know, when looking for the assets to invest for pension um, savers or, you know, members of pension plans, we generally look for long-term investments or high valid investments. And so, I mean, it provides, definitely provides the opportunity for, you know, improvements in financial assets and the performance of financial assets on a general level. But definitely uh, looking at it at a pension level, it is very important that we secure, you know, long, high valued assets. We look for also con conservative assets and we also try to diversify because with these pensions, of course, it can contribute to some amount of economic growth as well. So definitely um, I would say that on that aspect, looking at, you know, pensions, it is very important to our economy as well as, you know, to the members of the pension plans that they do earn from, from these investments. Conroy, where's the growth to come from in this industry? 
So, so even before I talk about the growth, never. Constant and, and Sonia spoke about two things, and I and, and that is why in my opening statement I said there are some good signs. The thing is that um, when you really look at the, the tourism worker pension scheme, I agree with both participants that that can become a catalyst in terms of of of, of covering other sectors. And um, and the other thing that I want to speak about is, and I think Sonia sits on that committee, the COVID-19 Economic Task Force. Am I correct? So I know that some recommendations. Yeah, I know some recommendations were made to the minister, and the minister, in his yeah. remark in Parliament, he spoke about some infrastructural changes. And I believe strongly, if there's a will to really implement, based on the success of those. Um, recommendations that were made in order for a pension plan to be sustainable two things must be in place one it, it you have to look at the income level of the people within the country constant spoke about it about, the, about a lot of poor people and the income level and the second thing that is very critical is really government involvement in terms of putting in funding into the get pension plan and a typical example of that is a tourism worker where there's a seed funding and what's the amount again? Is it, is it um, million? Yes. Two billion. Two billion. That's a seed funding. So that's critical. So, so I believe that if the recommendations that are, that, are, that, are, that are made by the task force, and the minister spoke about it in his article, in his Gleaner article, about the infrastructural changes, because it's two things that have to change. One, from a personal responsibility. You have to change your mindset. Government can't help that. You have to change your mindset about savings, long-term savings, to provide you for an income. So it's two things changes mindset. One, it has to be a major event. Something big has to happen, and it has to be negative. And I think the opportune time is right now. The big event is really COVID. That's the first thing. It's really behavioral changes. So the first thing on the part of individuals is really thinking about their future. And the next thing about the policy makers, this is a big change about the policy maker. The policy maker has the right time, the right time to make the decisions in terms of setting the right infrastructure to get people thinking differently. One, about how simple it is to get involved into a pension plan. It's difficult at this point in time. Constant spoke about the poor people, the helpers and all of those people. It's difficult to really get involved into this formal pension system. So once the government... Why is it difficult, really? Number one, the, the taxation. The way all the taxation system is set up, where you have all these different kinds of taxes. The employers, for example, myself and other persons, is going to be a deterrent to really set up, help get your employer to, because you can't calculate. You can't calculate how the taxes are to be done. So there's a recommendation that is done to the task force to, to, to lump everything into one taxation. So I'm saying that there's a, lump, a number of recommendations that are in, which I believe are sound recommendations. And in addition to that now, is government involvement, which I saw in the tourism worker. So I'm talking about the tourism worker. So we spoke about, Constance spoke about the NIS. That is the real place that we need to look at. But before people can get involved in the NIS, 1.269 million people are in the, is in the labor force. Only 500 contributing to the NIS. So therefore, to get more people as con to contribute in the NIS, you have to make the, simple, the system simple so that people can go anywhere and enroll into it. Then the next thing is to be on top of people's mind. So therefore, between the PIAJ, which I'm a part of, the government, all of these bodies come together now, is to bring awareness around it. So as I said before, what changes people's mindset? One, something negative, something big and negative, COVID. So it's going to change the mindset of the policy makers, hopefully, change the, policy ma change the mindset of corporate Jamaica. I know for once my organization, Victory Mutual Group, it is embedded in our purpose to really go out there and reach out to Jamaican for financial in inclusion. So if we move away from the mindset, as Constance said before, things change, where a person jump off the wagon from these uh, defined benefits and the regulation that allowed it. So therefore, if you have an aging population, you have a poor population, government not putting any money into the scheme, what kind of benefit are you going to have at the end of retirement, even for those people in the private plan? Especially when security prices falling. 
So in, 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 in my view, as you rightly said, where the opportunity lies going forward is really something looking at more like an approved retirement scheme. However, it has to be compulsory. In terms of employer's contribution, it has to be a compulsory. And that is where I believe the solution lies in terms of dealing in with this, this, this pension challenge that we have. So good can come out of COVID. Mm -hmm. To address the issue of the adequacy though, phase two of the pension legislation, the private sector, actually contemplates a locking in of contributions. And I know it's you know ticklish for people, but they want to have the right to decide because it's their own money. But what is happening is that the behavior, the current behavior patterns of persons, when they leave the jobs, in, instantly they write up the form, don't even want to talk to anybody, we're taking back the contributions. And so when they get to retirement, they may not have sufficient, or what they do have is insufficient because they would have extracted the majority of it as cash. So the only way to fundamentally address the issue of the adequacy is to have some form of locking in, to kind of take the power away from persons in that they have to look at leaving the money for what it is really there for, and that is to provide that income when you're not going to be able to work and we're not going to be able to give yourself an opportunity, a salary. I'd just like to ask uh, Sanya, in her position uh, on that uh, special committee, to tell us some of the recommendations that have come forward because we, we were told about unemployment insurance, I think it was, and that has to do with, it's in some way tied up with pension. Sanya? So I sat on a subcommittee chaired by um, Michael Leachin that looks specifically at, uh, my role was to look specifically at recommendations on pension reform. And what we had put forward to the minister was that currently there's um, the limit for investing in private companies is a limit of 5% and that's inclusive of equity and debt. For private equity and debt investments, um, there's a limit of 5%. So the recommendation has been to disaggregate, um, disaggregate private equity from private debt and to apply separate limits um, up to, uh, not up to, I mean, higher than 10%. Um, and I do believe maybe a recommendation of 10% is what would be put forward. But that was really the main thrust of what we were putting forward to um, allow a greater um, limit when it comes to, to investment in private companies. There were other, um, and then also a potential move on the general concentration limit from 10% to 20%, but I'm not sure if that actually um, is being put forward. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you, when you look at the growth of pension funds, you find that investing in private equity actually has significant returns, significant benefits to the economy as well. And there is a lot of hesitation because it's seen as a very risky asset class and Conroy can speak to that, but the truth is, in our regulatory framework, there are a lot of safeguards. And so not only are you required to have you know, trained, um, regulated, registered investment managers, every pension plan is required to invest in accordance with a statement of investment policies and principles, which is approved by the trustees, um, reviewed and, and signed off by the FSC as well. And so even if this investment class allowance, the allowance limit is, is raised, I think uh, that um, some, of the, uh, the, some of the concerns that um, industry players have because of the nature of the asset class um, will really be borne out because of the number of safeguards that are in place. So that was really the main thing that was put forward to the minister, which has been uh, adopted. I just wanted to also just speak to Latoya's point though around locking in, because at the same time where we, when we expect phase two to implement locking in, we also expect phase two to allow for hardship withdrawals. And in fact, the FSC is, had put forward a paper around looking at fast-tracking hardship withdrawals due to the uh, onset of COVID. And so there's going to be a bit of balancing because, as Latoya said, there are a lot of people who are not interested in participating in approved retirement schemes because their money right now is locked in. And there's going to be a lot of hesitancy um, or a lot of um, unhappiness when members learn that for superannuation funds, their monies are going to be locked in even when they leave the employment. Who, 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 should, who should be uh, dealing with this question of lock, locking in, uh, Sanya? Should it be government mandated? Should it be something in the law that says, look, 
once you put it into a pension fund, it can't be touched until the right time. I think so. I think it needs to be legislatively driven because as Latoya said, you know, once persons get their benefit statements and they see the amount of money they're able to tap into immediately on withdrawing from a particular pension plan, they are inclined to take that money because immediate needs are seen as far more of a priority than, you know, saving for the long term. And that's why I think the unlocking, which is, a re which is expected to be a reasonable counter to that or balance to that is to recognize that there are circumstances where persons will need to withdraw because of significant hardship. Now, we may disagree agree as to what the basis of the hardship withdrawal should be, but certainly um, as balancing um, element to legislation to what is anticipated in phase two regarding locking, and I think that will actually be important. But it has to be managed very carefully because if it's abused, you could find that it just immediately undoes all the effort that we've been, you know, we've been pushing for in terms of coverage. And so what I understand the recommendations to be is that it would only be a certain number of withdrawals allowed during the lifetime of the member. So the, what's on the table are two withdrawals in your lifetime. And it's a cap on 20% of your, the, the value of your account would you be able to withdraw over your lifetime. And so there, there are supposed to be certain safeguards. There are questions around whether the withdrawals will be taxed or not and whether or not taxing it would be a deterrent or would in fact be counter, counterproductive to the objective of withdrawing. But I definitely think that you, it, it should not be a plan-driven um, feature. It needs to be legislatively driven. Right. Candice, the, 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 the matter of locking in should be music to your ears because it's less of a headache <laughs> in terms of the asset management. <laughs> Tell us about that. Right. So one major part of managing pension assets is also to ensure that there is some level of liquidity. So even in you know the instance where they're locked in and so we would just ma ma uh, match the asset maturity with the profile of the pension plan or such i mean there is that component of liquidity if it needs that they you know do need a refund for whatever circumstance that presents but definitely locking in provides the avenue for more long-term investments i mean even looking at what is happening now with interest rates being low of course long-term investments you know um, is a good way, even with what is happening now with COVID and the impact that it has had on the stock market. And, you know, persons in the short term generally are a little, you know, a little more concerned because of what is happening now. But, I mean, it provides that greater understanding that pension is long term. So while this is happening now over the long term horizon, you will rebound, things will move back. And I mean, just to say that uh, with having that long term nature as well, it, it really builds some amount of confidence to show that even though this is happening now, this is what will happen in the long term. And so I believe that that locking in nature would definitely assist because it will provide for, you know, longer investments, a great opportunity to earn over the long term. But definitely as a part of what is happening and, you know, with managing pension assets, liquidity is also very important. Constance, we, 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 we'll come to you in a minute, uh, Conrad. But I just wanted to add something to her point. Sure. I support her point, but at the same time, I think when you really look at that, that's why government involvement is important if there's going to be drawdown, mm -hmm. because a drawdown can mean it can really, it can really create economic value. For example, when you look at most Jamaicans, if they're not going to put, use that drawdown to buy a, um, a consumer item that is of no value, but they're going to use the drawdown in order to do some farming, they're going to use that drawdown to probably buy a, 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 an economic asset that is going to turn over, which most Jamaicans want a startup. You want something to really start a business. So if the drawdown is in this kind of direction, it can bring positive value to the economy because that's what you really want to get the economy going. So when the government is making that decision, I think it's very critical to really look at the purpose for the drawdown in order to make it because this can really inspire economic growth. Uh, Constance, for the last three minutes that we have on air, I'd just like to get your to, to get your position on this matter of locking in. Are we are we really speaking about something impossible in light of the low levels of salaries the, that they, and the great income disparity that we have in in, in our economy? Right. I. I I'm not, I'm not fully um, on board with um, 
with looking in. I believe that we have to we have to do a lot more a lot more pension training. At the moment in our in our country, we don't have any kind of unemployment benefit except the contributions of the people who are in pension plans. And it's not a lot of them, but that's what they have. And we're not a country that saves a lot. So, you know, we, we really need to do a wider financial training. People, when people leave jobs for whatever reason, and sometimes it's to go to college or whatever, but the norm is I take the money from the pension fund because this is the only source of income I have. The only thing we have other than um, your pension savings, those people who are maybe fortunately getting terminated by the employer so that they can have a redundancy payment. But for other persons trying to move from, you know, position A to position B, the pension savings is the thing that ties them. Um, as a financial sector, we are going to have to, to come together and come up with systems that work together. I was disappointed when COVID happened and the first thing I heard out of COVID was, let us fast track paying people out money from their pension savings to balance COVID because we accepted that no place else is there any money for people to pull on, right? And that goes back to my pet peeve, which is people are paid too little and they don't have any ability to save. Then they have no unemployment benefits. So they are, you know, we have, we have people in a, we, we have people in a bind. We've got to find a way to allow the normal, ordinary people to be able to earn enough money to pay the rent, to save a little bit for emergency. We say those emergency funds should be between two and six months of salaries. I don't believe there's anybody, except for those of us probably sitting on this call, who have emergency funds. Um, maybe we can get employers themselves to begin to say, how can we, when we hire people, start taking half percent of their salary and stick it in a fund somewhere so that when people leave, there's a little money other than the pension fund from which they can pull. But we, we, have, to, we have to pensions together with um, employment, savings, all earnings. We have to pull it all we have to pull it all together. We are never going to improve the pension situation by legislation or anything else. Because I go back to, and you know, to correct something from earlier, anybody, any single Jamaican can contribute to the NIS. Right. And they can walk down to, to, to here a circle and pay the money, or they can buy a stamp card and pay it. And for a lot of those people, the contribution is a couple hundred dollars a week. Give them on retirement what I think of as a sensible benefit. We are lacking in education. We have got to start a, a, a whole skill training. We've got to stop the many little um, new initiatives. We have too many new initiatives. We need to pull all those new initiatives into one single framework so that we're not confusing, the, that we're not confusing people. Because I'm, I'm a professional, I do this every day and, I, and I'm confused sometimes. Now we've got to get it all together. And then we have got to train in a way we have never trained before, educate. And we have to remember that in countries where it looks like people are doing well, and there are countries where during the 2008 financial debacle, and we're going through the same thing now, in 2008, there was a commercial running in the US which said the only group of people who are doing okay today are those who are over 65. 
Because when everybody else was struggling, when people were losing their houses and their cars and they couldn't buy food, the retirees who live on Social Security, that group was getting their checks every month same way, and that group was doing okay. We have got to tackle this as a group together, get all the little initiatives, put them on one sheet of paper, and come up with something that works, and we have to make it work for the poor people because most of our country is poor people. 